Welcome to the 2021 Virtual Fall Lecture Series hosted by Grey Roots Museum and Archives. I'm your host, Karen Noble. We acknowledge with respect the history, spirituality, and culture of the Anishinaabek, Six Nations of the Grand River, Haudenosaunee, and Wendat, Wyandat, Wyandat peoples on whose tradition, traditional territories we gather and whose ancestors signed treaties with our ancestors. We recognize also the Métis and Inuit whose ancestors share this land and these waters. May we all, as treaty people, live with respect on this land and live in peace and friendship with all its diverse peoples. Thank you. Before we begin, there will be a question and answer period at the end of the presentation. You're welcome to submit a question in the YouTube comments. Please note, you must be logged into a YouTube account to do so. If you're watching on graybirds.com, access the video, the YouTube page by clicking on watchonyoutube.com in the bottom right of the video player. You can also submit a question to Grey Roots through Facebook Messenger or over email to media at greyroots.com. Thank you to Zach Erb, Media and Communications Coordinator at Grey Roots for providing technical support for this series. And now for the presentation of, of the day and the final talk of the series, Traces of the Durham Roads Black Pioneers. This talk will remain posted to view, so if you lose your connection, have to stop watching, want to watch any part again or tell a friend, you can still do so. Link available from greyroots.com or visit the Grey Roots Museum and Archives YouTube channel. Today's presenter, Naomi Norquay, Associate Professor in York University's Faculty of Education, is co-editor of Northern Terminus, the African Canadian History Journal, and president of the Old Durham Road Black Pioneer Cemetery Committee. Naomi is also currently coordinating the Greenwood Cemetery Potter's Field Reclamation Project, sponsored by the Social Science, Sciences and Humanities Research Council. This project is combing through historical records to reconstruct the lives behind the names of the 1,200 plus people who are buried in the plot. And now, welcome Naomi. Thanks, Karen. I'm just going to share my screen here. so. We can have a we can have a look um, at this presentation. There we are. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Karen and I'd like to thank Grey Roots for this opportunity to share some of the stories I've been collecting for ooh, probably almost a lifetime, not quite. Um, the presentation I'm doing today is based on my own 55 year relationship with the Durham Road. It's based on previous research presentations I've done at the annual Black History event that's hosted by Grey Roots and publications uh, in the journal Northern Terminus. Um, today, I'm gonna focus on the families, the Black settling families that came to the area in Artemisia Township around 1850, when the road was first opened for settlement. More families came in the 1860s, uh, but my focus is on those who came the earliest. So how did I come to this? In the mid 1960s, when I was a child, my parents purchased three 50 acre lots on the south side of the Durham Road. We learned from an elderly farmer neighbor about the black preacher who owned our place. Then he had no, no name, we had no other information, but this information made our place special. And I, I remember as I was growing up that, you know, sometimes when we had people visit my, we would, we would haul out this little tidbit um, that there had been a black preacher uh, on our place uh, and left it at that. Um, I spent my childhood roaming the land along the Durham Road, including this high hill uh, that the, the slide shows uh, where as a kid I tobogganed and flew kites. I took this slide, oh, probably about 10 years ago. Uh, it's looking east towards the Black Settlements burial ground, which I'll talk about later in the presentation. So, the Durham Road. The Durham Road 
was an east-west colonization road cutting across Gray and Bruce counties all the way to Lake Huron. These two photos I took just show the photo on the left, the road looking east, and the photo on the right, the road looking west. Uh, actually, I took this at the bend in the road where the road now diverges from the original survey. Area treaties were signed with First Nations in 1818, the, the easterly portion, and 1836, the westerly portion, and this opened up the area for settlement. Uh, David Gibson was hired to survey the Durham Road through Osprey, Artemisia, and Glenel Townships, and he did this in 1848-49. As instructed, he laid it out in long, narrow, 50-acre lots. His field notes describe rolling land ridges, beaver meadows, thick swamp, an abundance of stony land and gravelly subsoil. He cautioned in his notes, timber unfit for settlement, very wet, bridging required. I've got two maps here that have helped me think about the community. The, the map on the left is from an 1880 Atlas of Gray County. So basically it shows the area roughly 30 years after it was surveyed. I've marked that, and if you can follow the arrow here, I, I've marked the Durham Road uh, in yellow. This was the original Durham Road. Here it kind of had to diverge around some swamp. Uh, I came along, went into Priceville, and so continued all the way to Durham. But you'll note that there's another road here called the Durham Road. And this was um, the, originally the Collingwood Road. It was the road that connected uh, Flesherton um, and the Toronto Sydenham Road to Colling Collingwood to the east. And you can see that it kind of cut at an angle, and then it came into 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 Durham here and just the other side of Durham, it joined the original Durham Road. So this stretch of the road that I'm mostly going to be talking about today became known as the old Durham Road. You'll notice that the, the, uh, the map shows the, the, the lots, the long 50 acre lots um, that were, you know, quite arbitrarily straight lines, not paying any attention to the topography of the land. And that meant that um, in terms of settlement, there was no guarantee of arable land. It was really luck of the draw. So if we look here at the, the topographical map, which is a, 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 a more or less modern map, um, you note, I note a number of things. Uh, first of all, I'll just orient you to the Durham Road, the old Durham Road. It's this one here. There's the bend where it, it made a diversion. This little black dotted line is the closed portion of the road and it's closed all the way into Priceville. There's the original Durham Road there and the other side of Priceville, it joins up uh, with the original road again. So if you look at the, the topography of this, of, of this area, you see that uh, it, it's elevated. There are very high hills, drumlins, eskers, um, basically hilly land with some flat bits in between, you might say. It's also very swampy. Lots of swamp, lots of little streams, and of course the Saugeen River here, uh, and of course waterways would have to have bridges over them. Um, swampy land is actually the hardest to clear. Um, the next photo, this is of, I've taken some current day photos of the closed portion of the road. The one on the left um, looks uh, east to Priceville and the one on the, sorry, west to Priceville, and the one on the east looks east to the cemetery. Um, the, these roads, uh, they're filling in, uh, but uh, they're still discernible uh, if, if you walk along. So who came? Who came? 
many of these black settlers uh, were coming to Canada to escape the heinous institution of slavery, which had been outlawed in British North America in 1834. Uh, so blacks came before that time because in 1793, uh, it was forbidden to um, import any new slaves we, or enslaved people. We had people in slavery in Canada up until um, 1834, but after that time, uh, when it was abolished, it became a, a, a more desirable location for those escaping slavery to the, to the south of us. Um, but I think our historical imagination has remained somewhat stunted. I believe that, um, and I've pulled up this image of the running man, uh, because I think our focus still seems to remain on the Underground Railroad and this escape from slavery. And this is a, an image you'll see today um, to note that uh, escape. Um, and while the details of escape are, are clearly important, my focus is on African Canadians as settlers. So who came? This is a, a report written in 1849 uh, that lists prospective settlers to the stretch of road uh, that I had outlined in, in yellow, just east of Priceville in Artemisia Township. Um, these people, these families were getting location tickets. So we have Chauncey Simons and his son Rosal, Levi Johnston, David King, John Johnston and his son Levi Johnston, Philemon Workman, Lemuel Brown and his son Benjamin, John Brown and his son Samuel, John Wesley Levi and his son John, Thomas Mason and David Mason, Larkin Alverson, Lewis Howard, and his son, Daniel Banks, Dorsey Ambush, John Laro Sr., John Laro Jr., Wesley Laro, William Yobanks, Henry Cowsby. So these, these men came to the office and indicated that they would like to settle on this newly surveyed portion of the road. It's interesting to me, uh, the number of sons who have joined their fathers in, in asking for location tickets. Many of these sons were young. I think the youngest was seven. So it really suggests a strategy, uh, a strategy that the, the, the family um, came up with to ensure that luck of the draw, one of their lots might be arable and farmable. On the right hand page, you see that there's a list of people who um, of, of prospective settlers who actually were hoping to purchase land an adjacent lot as well. And they're listed there uh, on this list, uh, Chauncey Simons, Levi Johnston, John Johnston, Philemon Workman and Lemuel Brown. So here's an example of a location ticket that would be issued. This was for James Handy. James Handy and his family is not on that initial list I showed you, but um, they came around uh, 1851. They actually came from Albion Township further south in, in Peel County. They uh, had already uh, had the experience of clearing land uh, and settling. Um, James Handy Sr. Uh, was 82 when he came to the Durham Road. He claimed a lot, lot number 26, right beside his son, James Handy Jr., who had lot 25. And I just will note the requirements here, just reading from this. Uh, it says, number one, he is to proceed and occupy at once the land assigned to him. Should he not do so within one month of the date of his ticket, or should he abandon the land after having been placed upon it, he will be considered as having lost all claim to receive land. So the message was clear. You've been given access to crown land. You go and live there. Secondly, he was required to clear and place under crop 12 acres of land located within four years of the date of this ticket, build a house 18 feet by 20 and reside on the land until this settlement duty is performed 
and when completed, he will be entitled to his patent free of expense. And then the, the uh, instructions go on from there. So these families got location tickets and they went and found their lots as laid out by David Gibson and got to work. This is a report uh, of uh, 1851 that actually reports on who's actually there. So this one is um, for the north side of the Durham Road, the one on the left here, and it lists the lots all the way down, the lot numbers, the township is um, uh, Artemisia. It lists the country where they're from. Now, what's interesting, William Ferguson, right there by Priceville, would be uh, was from Scotland, but most of the others uh, who were all black were from mostly from the United States. Some from had been born in Upper Canada. Lists um, number in the family, their religion, uh, how many acres, and their occupation. But the column that really interests me is this one. It's hard to read. It says, how long in Canada? So it gives the years that these settlers had already been in Canada. And what I read this, I, I found this quite surprising. And it's partly because you know, I had been you know, educated on the, the, the idea of the, the, the Black history is about um, the Underground Railroad, right? People on the run. So here we have it. Uh, Levi Johnston, 17 years. John Johnston, 30. John Harrison, 20. Henry Cowsby, 16. Dorsey Ambush, 8. Lemuel Brown, 25. And, and so on, all the way down the list. Um, Dorsey Ambush had been there the least amount of time. He had only been in Canada uh, eight years. But interestingly, he's, I'll talk about him a little bit later. Um, he, he's uh, someone I got to know through another publication about Black history in, in Upper Canada. John Johnston, 30 years. The average time, uh, looking at these two lists, the one on the left is for the north side, the one on the right for the south side of the road is 17 years. So all of these men, and I'm, uh, I'm going to start saying families, even though it's the men who are listed in these documents, these families had been in Upper Canada for quite some time, by the time they came and moved to Gray County. Many of them were actually part of the Queensbush settlement. And I've, I've, I've put here the, the cover of Linda Brown Kubish's wonderful book on the Queen Bush, Queensbush settlement, uh, which was written a number of years ago. Um, basically, the Queensbush settlement was sort of west of Fergus in Wellington County. Um, and in this, in this particular settlement, in the, in the 1830s, in some cases, even the 1820s, the, the, the people were encouraged to come, on squat, to come and squat on land that hadn't been surveyed. So when you squat, you're, you're living on land that you don't actually have legal access to. Um, so settlers, they had, they had signed treaties with the First Nations. They wanted to open up this area, get people in, get settlers in, but they hadn't surveyed it. So they invited people to squat. So people came, uh, all sorts of people came to this area. And then when they did finally get around to surveying, of course, uh, <laughs> they, they found, for example, that two squatters were on one lot or, you know, people were not necessarily placed in relation to the to the lot lines. Uh, but further to that, at that point, there for some, there was a policy that people had to buy their lots. And so what happened was when these these people and, and other settlers there as well, I've I've listed here all the all the families um, who came to the Durham Road who also were in the Queen's Bush. Um, they were invited to buy the land they had cleared and improved. But the irony was because they had cleared it and improved it, the value of the land had gone up. So, 
in these petitions, they're petitioning to be allowed to pay for their land in installments. And the petitions are denied. There, there, there actually were four. Uh, there was one, I think, in 1850 as well. I just went through them and found the names of the people who came to the Durham Road. So these, these men and their families already had, had all that skill, learned all that skill of clearing land, farming, and more importantly, I think, making community. So when they came to the Durham Road, uh, they had already uh, proved themselves to be upper, upper Canadian citizens. Um, one of the, uh, the, the things that, that uh, came to um, challenge their, their getting their land in the Queen's Bush is that they all were told they had to be British citizens. So there's uh, an interesting uh, list of citizenship from 1849. Most of these men went to Guelph um, to get their citizenship. Um, their allegiance to the crown, and then went straight to the the uh, location office uh, to get their location tickets. I'm going to just talk about a little bit about um, a way to frame the community. Um, often, um, the kind of oral history and the conversation I've heard over the years is that the black community, the black settlement can't, came and went away very quickly. Um, and it's almost as if I, I hear people say it as if they were misplaced. They were in the wrong place. It was too cold. They, they weren't farmers. They didn't have those skills. They went away. They went to Owen Sound. They went to Collingwood. Um, and of course, my research has found that this isn't entirely the case. So I turned to a Canadian uh, historical geographer, David Wood, who wrote an interesting book called Making Ontario. Uh, and he posits three kinds of settlers. So we think about settlers going to the frontier, wherever the frontier is, wherever treaties have been negotiated, well, also where they haven't been negotiated, but where treaties have been negotiated, the areas get opened up for settlement, that becomes the frontier. So he talks about three kinds of people, settlers, transients, sojourners, and persisters. Transients usually leave within a couple of years. They're for the most part, young men who follow the frontier to work in the intensified labor market uh, that the frontier provides. Makes sense. Um, Daniel Banks, who got a, a location ticket, uh, he was barely on the Durham Road before he moved, he moved and uh, was in Oro Township. So that's one example of a transient. The sojourners uh, tend to stay seven or eight years and then they leave. And these are usually families who get a location ticket, uh, they fulfill settlement duties, um, and for a variety of reasons, um, move. Um, the thing about when you get crown land for free, once you've, you know, once you've uh, done all the settlement duties, then often people would, some people would sell their land and then continue to rent it because by selling their land, they get capital. So in some cases, um, you know, people sold their land and then remained as tenants, or they sold their land um, to gain capital so they could go somewhere else. Uh, why did people move? Well, I think we saw from the topographical map, um, they moved when their land was of poor quality. They moved when there were other opportunities for employment that were opening up, which was certainly happening um, in Owen Sound and Collingwood, which were port towns at the time. Um, so they moved there to uh, places that are gonna offer a more stable livelihood. Some of them uh, move because they never get title to their land or, or that they've sought more land and haven't been able to acquire it. And an example of this is Larkin Alverson. Uh, his 50 acre lots, aside from the little corner he had as the community burial ground was, was just drumlins and hilly and gravelly. 
Uh, but right next door was a government lot that the government put up for sale that was quite arable, it was flat, arable land. Uh, he, he tried to buy it, uh, but he was denied in favor of a white settler who would come from elsewhere. Um, in other words, he had basically been denied an opportunity to build on what he'd already accomplished through clearing his land and contributing to the community. So once he got his crown patent, he sold, he was there about seven years, and then he moved to Halton County. The third category that um, Wood talks about are persisters. Persisters are families that stay at least 10 years. They generally have better land. They may have access to capital. They usually have larger families, fewer fatalities, basically better luck. Um, they stay, and if they stay forever, <laughs> they become known as the founding families. They usually acquire more land and they gain political power and influence. Most of the families that I've listed so far stayed at least 10 years. Some stayed for 20 or 30 years or even more. In terms of those who left after 10 or more years, uh, because the farmland was quite marginal, um, often another source of income was needed. So uh, often the men worked in the forestry industry. The Southern Ontario basically was cleared of forest by the early 1900s. And in, and in this part of Gray County, uh, the last of the timber, the great timber came out by 1906. So uh, a kind of a, an alternate uh, uh, source of income um, evaporated at that point. Um, so many of them left when those other opportunities um, um, petered out. Families whose children had decided to leave the farm moved to Owen Sound or Collingwood uh, when they were left uh, just the parents alone, um, usually with the death of one of them, the other one would wind up in Owen Sound or Collingwood living with their grown children. Uh, and of course, I think this is a, a, a still a pattern in, in rural communities uh, that happens when, when, when the children leave. Um, the third way that uh, the community seems to have evaporated uh, over time is that um, uh, people intermarried. It was kind of a hopeful thing that black and white settlers intermarried. However, when the families could pass for white, they most often dropped their black heritage. And this was a strategy for survival in a very racist and racialized environment where um, the all things British were still sort of rendered uh, superior and supreme. Um, I did a little survey of some of the local newspapers from this time and um, I was shocked at the constant barrage of racist vitriol in the form of jokes, anecdotes and foreign reports. It seemed to me that the ever expanding British empire kept its newspaper men busy asserting the rights and supremacy of Britain and all things British. Regardless of how long they stayed, they were committed to community. So here's some example of community building. Dorsey Ambush was a healer and a preacher of the gospel. John Wesley Levi was the police constable in Priceville. And Sandy Jr. became a school trustee. Larkin Alverson um, owned, you could say, the community burial ground. Larkin Alverson, Philemon Workman, and David Mason, Mason were, were hired uh, by the township and county in road clearing. Gabriel Black sold a corner of his 50 acre lot for the, the local school, uh, school SS number seven. I found evidence of all the male residents signing petitions and affidavits in support of neighbors and community endeavors. This was a community that wanted to thrive. 
So this is an interesting letter, and I, I thank Karen uh, for drawing this to my attention. Uh, it is uh, uh, in the collection of the George Snyder papers that are housed at Grey Roots Museum and Archives. Um, George Snyder was the land agent at the time that these families came to the old Durham Road. This is dated uh, February 27th, 1851. I'm just going to read it. It's a little, sometimes a little hard to read um, handwriting. Sir, Mr. George Snyder, government agent. Sir, we as a body of colored people, we petition to your honor in order that you will prevent a man of color by the name of Charles Maloney from having a grant of land in the township of Artemisia. The reason that we petition to your honor is that this man is a bad man in the neighborhood. This man is known by us in the Queen's Bush. The agent, Mr. Jackson, on account of this, refused to let this man have a grant of land. Sir, your petitioners, peti petitioners will ever pray. John Wesley Levi, Dorsey Ambush, James Handy, Larkin Alverson, John Brown, David Mason, Lewis Howard, James Jackson, Philemon Workman, Lemuel Brown, John Johnson, Levi Johnson, Chauncey Simons, Gabriel Black, Franklin Crawford, and James Handy. And on the fold of the letter, it says, petition and letter of John Wesley Levi and others wishing me to not give a grant to Charles Maloney. And that's in um, George Snyder's hand. <laughs> so I love this letter. I mean, okay, it, 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 it suggests a number of things. One of the things it does confirm that many of these families were in the Queen's Bush settlement. Okay, if they're talking about the land agent there, Mr. Jackson, and how um, you know, they, they got him to refuse Charles, poor old Charles Maloney, a grant of land. So that's one thing. But the, but the other thing about this letter um, for me is that it does suggest they valued their newfound stability. They wanted community peace and they wanted community respectability. And for whatever their reasons, <clears throat> Charles Maloney was one person that they, they didn't want to have in the community. Um, I, I think that, um, and uh, I, you know, I think that, I think the, 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 other, the other piece here, of course, is that um, not all these men were in the Queen's Bush. The Handys weren't, um, uh, Chauncey Simon wasn't, Gabriel Black wasn't. Uh, but it's interesting that they, 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 they came together with their neighbors and, and, and put this petition together. To my knowledge, Charles Maloney was not given a grant of land, uh, but um, I haven't, I, I'm sure I could do a little more research more to confirm that. Yeah, so one of the challenges in this kind of research when you're trying to you know, get a sense of a community is that the women kind of disappear. They're not um, on the land registry documents. They're not on the location tickets. They're not the ones signing the petitions. Um, you do find the women are in the census. That's how I found their names. Uh, they are, when we had them, uh, marriage records and birth and death records. But otherwise, they seem kind of invisible. Uh, so I wanted to just think about the women and their contributions uh, to, um, to community. I mean, they were all involved in the backbreaking work of clearing land, planting crops, keeping the home fires burning, preparing meals, and in bearing children. Uh, while looking at the, uh, the census documents for most of these women, they were having children every two years. Uh, and many of them had very large families. Charlotte Handy had at least nine children. And of course, we remember that uh, both women and children die in childbirth. Children die in infancy and in childhood. So, I mean, it's not just for the women, but you know, there's also that emotional toll on a community is when its children die. So, I just wanted to mark these women, um, and they, 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 
swirl around in my head uh, sometimes, and I, I like to think of them. Mehedabel Simons, Clarissa Workman, Phoebe Brown, Elsie Black, Charlotte Handy, Jane Brown, Anne Levi, Mary Rose Cosby, Rosetta Howard, Maria Jackson, Sarah Johnson, Charlotte Mason, Eliza Washington, and there were others, but these are the ones that um, I've, I've included. I've included today. Okay. So historic documents are great because you get names and you get demographics. You get that kind of information, you, you know, with the petitions, you un get an understanding of what they cared about, what was going on. But what I don't have access to, uh, for the most part, are family papers or, or, or photographs, um, you know, letters, diaries, journals, that kind of thing. For the most part, these aren't documents that have made their way into our, our museums and archives. And so I've had to really think about how I can animate this community. And I did do an oral history project in 2011-12. Um, in that project, talking to local people, I, it, I came up with a handful of stories that they all, they all told the same stories because these were the stories that had found their way down uh, to them from their, their own ancestors, their parents and their grandparents. And the stories were very general, like, um, we remember walking or their grandparents remember walking down the road and hearing the beautiful singing coming out of the little church. Lovely. Um, but in terms of sort of specifics about community, there wasn't a lot. And so I, I went to the land to kind of find the remnants. And of course, the, the first place and the, and the kind of key place to go is to Gray County Road 14 and the old Durham Road, which here is called Durham Road B. This is looking east. On the left of this photograph is the burial ground that was uh, in the corner of Larkin Alverson's lot. And on the right is the schoolhouse, uh, the land having been sold by Gabriel and Elsie Black. Actually, Elsie's name is on the document, which is kind of cool, um, that they, they sold the land for the schoolhouse. So let's just say a little bit about the schoolhouse here. Um, the, the school that first served the community was farther west towards Priceville on lot 11 and roughly from about 1856 to the early 1860s, there was a little log schoolhouse there with a, a Scottish schoolmaster. The schoolhouse served the kids on the, the old Durham Road and in Priceville. And then around about the middle of, Price, uh, of 1860s, Priceville got its own school. And that meant that the little school on lot 12, 11 had um, fewer kids, but also it turned out to be kind of farther away from where the most of them were living. So Gabriel and Elsie Black uh, sold the corner of their lot, uh, number 21, on the south side uh, to the school board because um, it was more in the heart of the community. The current structure here was built in 1880, uh, you know, mid 1960s, the government closed all the one room schools and this became like all the other one room schools in the province, a private residence or in some cases, a museum, but not in this case. The old Durham Road Black Pioneer Cemetery as it now is known, this was the sandy corner of Larkin Alverson's very hilly lot and at some point he allowed his neighbors to bury their dead here. And like most rural burial grounds, at this time it was unregistered and was on private land. Um, and it basically was owned by whoever owned Lot 21. So when um, Larkin Alverson sold uh, in 50, uh, 1857, the, neck, the subsequent owner, allowed people to, to continue using the burial ground. And the, uh, the understanding is, is that there were burials there so, till sometime in the 1880s. Um, fast forward to 1930s, the farmer who owned the burial ground, which was you know, now not having burials and it had been for you know, probably 50 years, 
uh, inactive in that sense. Uh, stones perhaps falling down. He decided since he owned it, he would farm it. And he removed all the headstones and plowed the land for crops. Um, some of the stones were thrown in a rock pile behind the cemetery and the rest disappeared. Um, and this uh, community collusion uh, allowed this to happen. Uh, neither the county nor the township said a word. But by 1989, a group of local people realized they really had to write this community wrong. They all knew, everyone knew there was a burial ground there. So they approached the landowners who agreed to portion it off and give it to the township. They got it officially registered as a cemetery and they found four headstones um, in the rock pile behind the cemetery. This is the monument that was built in 2015. It, it's a permanent structure that uh, houses the, the four stones. I've just got one picture of a couple of a couple of pictures here, two of them here, James Washington, who died in 1856, and James Handy, whom I've mentioned, the 82-year-old who came in 1851, and he died in 1863, he was 95, uh, clearly the griot uh, of the community. Um, so these are lovely remnants of the community. They're, they're, you know, anyone can come, well, the schoolhouse is private, but anyone can come to the cemetery and, and have a look. And, and I really hope if you haven't visited that you do. The other place that I've looked, um, and this is, happens in the spring, is I've, I've looked um, on my place and, and other people's places uh, for stone foundations. Um, the photo on the left is probably where uh, the Black preacher, uh, whose name was Edward Patterson, had his home. And the photo on the right uh, is right near a spring, and it's another part of my family's property. And we think it might have been a, a, a cooling shed for milk. We're not sure. Um, but these, um, these are remnants of this community. And one of the things that I, I really uh, like about both of them is that when I, when I kind of poke around in the foundations, I, I find little bits of mortar. And here are some ones that I pulled out. Um, if you're in, from this area, you know that it's limestone and you know that in the past, many farms in the area had lime kilns. So the mortar was made from fire, locally fired limestone that was mixed with sand and water, sort of like the Romans did it. Um, so, and, and to me, the, 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 the mortars that kind of for, become a kind of metaphor for community, the, you know, the things that hold us together, right? That keep us connected. Associated with this, uh, with the Black Preacher's home um, are shards of crockery that are likely from his family's kitchen midden. Um, I find these in my garden every year. Frost heave. I love the spring. Frost heave brings these little, little gems to the surface. And I've, I've actually established quite a large collection. Uh, these are all mostly blue willow pattern, but I'll just point to this one here. That's a clay pipe. Um, you know, I don't have enough to make the entire pipe or the entire pot, but they, they do speak to me about the place of home. They speak to me about domesticity. Like the, we often think about pioneers as they're out in the land and they're clearing and they're, they're farming and there's this heavy labor, which there was. But then I find these little shards of blue willow and I, and I think about that, that interior home space and maybe a cup of tea. Another part, um, another place I've looked are, are the fences. Now, uh, if you're from anywhere in Southern Ontario, you probably recognize the snake rail, uh, split rail, cedar rail fence as, as kind of a ubiquitous symbol of pioneer days. Um, you know, for many years, the village of Flesherton had a fall fair called the Split Rail Festival, 
Artemisia's official history is the split is the split rail country book. Um, I have a pet theory about these fences. Of course, on the frontier, they're the easiest to build because they don't require posts. You just, you know, you, you get the the posts zigzagging like this. So they're easier to build. They're, they were built with the lumber that was being cleared out in Gray County. There was lots of white cedar and white cedars easy, easier to split than elm, <laughs> uh, easier to split. Uh, and of course, the, 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 the quality of cedar means that it, it lasts and lasts and lasts. So these are two fences. The one on the left is on my property that separates uh, Edward Patterson, the black preacher from Chauncey Simon's place. Uh, um, and this one on the right is actually in Glen Elg uh, Township. I love this fence. You see the farmer's field here. And then here is a great big row of rocks that of course, uh, anyone in who farms in Gray County will tell you is the, the first uh, crop off the field in the spring after frost eve has has thrown more stones to the surface. Um, my, my pet kind of theory about this is the snake rail fence is believed to have originated in, in Virginia, okay? When Virginia was being settled and cleared. Um, and so I'm, I'm guessing that blacks coming from the states, certainly from any area of the states where there had been frontier, um, where had it been the frontier, uh, blacks coming from other areas of Ontario would have known how to make these fences. Uh, probably not a fence one would see in Britain since they lost their forests, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years ago. So I, I, for me, this snake rail fence is a symbol of black settlement. Of course, the other sort of remnant of this community and, and other settlers it, are the wild apple trees. They, they line the, the, fence, the fences and the road allowances all along the Durham Road. I, I, I'm surprised every fall when I come go along and I, I see all the different apples growing uh, on these trees. Of course, these are descendants of the original ones. Um, I think it's important to kind of place the apple tree in on the frontier and in these pioneering homes is that, that, that um, the apple, apples were grown um, and actually in some places in the states on the frontier that you, you had to plant apple trees. Apple cider is safer than water in many pot times of the year. And so these trees were grown for, for making cider and also making cider vinegar. Uh, because cider vinegar was a disinfectant and a preservative. So uh, I guess that's, um, for me, the, the, the you know, I, I, I think about cider making, I think about the apple trees as, as, a, as a lovely kind of symbol of community, the ways in which uh, these families live together, work together, and celebrated together, they worship together, they valued education, they sent, they wanted their kids to go to school. Um, and they really, really worked hard at making community. And just to end, I guess I, you know, I'm, I'm feeling it particularly today with the, the new variant we're, we have now uh, amongst us. I, I, I feel we're in this sort of, the state of perpetual uncertainty. And, um, you know, one of my coping mechanisms for right now um, is to think of the things that I know are for sure. And a couple of the things that I know are for sure is that next spring, when I go out to my garden, I'm going to find some more shards. I know for sure that's going to happen. And the other thing I know for sure next spring is that all the apple trees along the old Durham Road are going to blossom and make me very, very happy. That's the end of my presentation. Thanks for being here with me. And um, I will welcome any questions now or 
if later you think of them, send them to Grey Roots and I'll get them and I'll, I'll answer them. So thanks very much. Well, thanks so much, Naomi, uh, for your talk and all the work you uh, put into preparing. Um, if someone's doing research, do you have any uh, thoughts about what your most fruitful source has been or uh, fruitful sources? Okay, yeah. I mean, it depends what kind of research. Um, certainly, I learned that the land of the people I'm researching, the, the actual community has been a really wonderful place to go and learn. Um, because the archives have been, sorry, but, at, you know, when they were closed, I, I had relied on archives. I had you know, come to Grey Roots and looked at the land abstracts and, and the books you have um, on the, the kind of the land record, um, though, or, or personal papers that are held in local archives um, where the archivist knows that if you look in so-and-so's papers, you'll learn something. So the, the archives are always the best source, but if you can't get to an archive or if they're closed, as uh, they were for much of this last year, I found um, the online sort of genealogical um, resources. The National Archives of Canada has all the, the census says up to 1921. 31 should be coming out soon. It's cert they're all searchable. Uh, you go to the uh, Mormons uh, website, Family Search. Um, it's free. You can access all of Ontario's um, uh, death death records, birth records, marriage records uh, quite easily. They're th searchable as well. So those are places to start. Did I say anything else? Um, read other people's research. Even like I, I found works. Um, I wish I could haul one out here, but I, I, I'm not going to find it. You know, I've I've read I've read um, books on um, well, well, you know, geography. I've read books on you know old recipes, things that will give me a, a taste for what life might have been like. Yeah, and definitely gems hide in the footnotes. Yes, <laughs> you're reading for sure. And um, are there uh, you might you mentioned uh, a lot of names and. Uh, professions of people and, and some details about um, various uh, pioneers. Are there, is there any pioneer with a unique story or for whom a special resource with, you know, it was kind of a gold mine or kind of a surprise <laughs> that kind of information was recorded? Or is there any ones that stick with you? Well, I, 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 I've mentioned the black preacher. He, he I didn't, um, uh, focus on him. His name is Edward Patterson. And, um, you know, he was just the black preacher. We didn't know his name until I got to the great gray roots archives and found him in the, the land abstract. Um, but then I, f I wasn't sure if it was him or the guy after him. Right. So, uh, but, uh, 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 Greta Kennedy, uh, 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 another researcher up in Gray, Gray County, found at Gray Roots a photograph of Edward Patterson and his family Bible. And those, those two artifacts just, you know, just they kind of ignited in me this, this beautiful sense of curiosity and joy that I found something really tangible about somebody. So he's, he's um, somebody that um, I was able to, once I had his name, I was able to find him in, in the census and, you know, his marriage certificate and his death certificate and his obituary and all those things uh, came to light. Um, he's a really neat connection to Owen Sound because um, he actually first arrived in Owen Sound, I think around 1860. Uh, maybe a little before that. And he, he mostly lived in Owen Sound, but he bought acreage on the, on the, on the Durham Road um, and uh, actually bought a few acreages, sold, sold some of them, kept some of them. And he and his family 
basically spent time on the Durham Road and in Owen Sound. So he's kind of a cool connection that way. Don't know if there's... Um, there's a question here, I'm just asking for clarification um, about the squatters. Would that specifically be the Durham Road or the Queens Bush more generally? Oh, okay. Um, well, there's lots of evidence of squatters everywhere. I mean, when, when David Gibson was um, surveying uh, Melanchthon Township, uh, he found squatters. They were, the surveyors were required to note them. I don't know if they always did. Um, I didn't find any notation of squatters on the Durham Road in his notes. Doesn't mean they weren't there or in the vicinity, but he didn't note them. The squatters I was talking about were in particular relation to what's called the Queen's Bush Settlement, uh, which was a settlement um, uh, west of Fergus. Um, the Queen's Bush, the Queen's Bush is also the name that was given to kind of Gray and Bruce County um, in the day, in Vicky's, Vicky's day. Uh, so it was, it's a general term. Uh, I believe that when um, Charles Rankin uh, surveyed the Garifraxa Road, that uh, he noted squatters up at Negro Creek. I think that's one, one idea there. So there were squatters here and there. Um, were they on the Durham Road in Artemisia? Uh, I, I just don't know. Um, it didn't appear in his notes. Um, probably from oral history, I understand they were in Priceville, in the Priceville area. Well, that's great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, there's a question about the Mead family on the Old Durham Road in particular, just um, some possible sources for the Mead family. Uh, yeah, basically just, just that. Yeah, just sure. sure. The, the John, John and Ellen Meads came in, I think, 1864. They came from Hamilton. They were, uh, John Meads had come from Maryland to Hamilton where he met Ellen and uh, I think it was Griffin uh, an Irish girl and they married and brought with them a couple of kids. They actually um, uh, came to uh, either an, I think an uncle of uh, John's. So land records uh, for sure. Um, the family uh, in terms of they're in the census in Hamilton in 1861. The family's in the 1871 census in, um, in Artemisia Township. So certainly those census records are good. Uh, there's also a really a uh, good interview with two Meads descendants <laughs> in Northern Terminus in, in our journal. Um, I interviewed uh, Carl Stevenson and um, Steve Harris, who are descendants of that family. So that's a kind of a secondary resource people could people could go to. That's great. Thank you. Um, and there's a question about um, any documentation that might show interactions between Black settlers and Indigenous. Uh, oh, that's interesting. Um, I haven't, I haven't um, yet looked for anything in terms of this specific area. Um, I'm actually writing a piece for the journal that links um, the find of an indigenous spear point in the Sogging River and a fisherman's path that has roots in the Black community. Um, I think that, that uh, I mean, one of, when I retire, one of my projects is to actually um, engage um, that particular research to see if I can find out more from indigenous uh, community members um, in, Gray, in, in Gray County. Um, but that's all I can really offer at this point about that. Great, thank you. Uh, so there's a question, um, maybe a seeking of clarification. About, um, so you mentioned how there's a lot of settlers that had been, um, hadn't recently come from America. So they, they had, you know, the 17 years, 16 years. Uh, 
So the question is, it sounds like the Durham Road Black community didn't come as a result of the Underground Railroad. So they perhaps could have, uh, but not directly to here. Um, what caused them to settle in this area in particular? So oh, okay. uh, curiosity about maybe why they left the other um, place that they had been, like if they were in Peel County or... Um, so I, I think in terms of the big group of them that came from the Queensbush settlement where they had petitioned three times to be able to purchase their land on credit, the land that they had cleared and, and improved and they were denied. So the, the, in the Queensbush settlement, basically the government was saying, well, sorry, we're gonna sell it out from under your feet, goodbye. That, that's what happened there. Um, Chauncey Simon's family, I, I, I've been, finding, um, partly in relation to the Potter's Field project, I'm finding people coming from, you know, families coming from as far away as Niagara. Chauncey Simon's family were in Durham uh, uh, Township in Oxford County. What would bring them up there? I don't know, other than a speculation, a couple of things. Uh, one is, if you're looking for free land, the only place there's going to be free land is on the frontier. The only place where the government's going to say, here's a location ticket. You do the work, you own it. That's the only place you're going to find free land. So if you're looking for free land, you go to the frontier. But the only thing I think, um, and I don't, again, it's just document. I keep finding people in this community visiting people in other places. Or, or marrying somebody from another, another Black community. So I get a sense of um, a kind of a network amongst the Black settlers. It's, I mean, lots of, lots of immigrants had networks, right? But uh, this is what I'm studying. And I'm seeing connections um, that suggest that the, the, this, the people in Oro Township knew the people on the Durham Road and they, they knew the communities in Guelph and they knew the communities in St. Catharines. So I think there was that kind of uh, connection so that people would, would think, hey, you know, Maybe I want it. Maybe I should go try there. At least I know I, I'm going to know some people. That could be what it is, part of, partly what it is. That's great. Thank you. And um, just curious if you've found any interesting connections between your Durham Road research and the Owen Sound Greenwood Cemetery Potter's Field project. Yes, yes, lots actually. Um, uh, I, I want to premise this by saying that um, the, 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 the notion of the indigent plot or the potter's field, the place where, where the state pays for the burials and this, you know, dumps people in the ground and forgets about them. Um, you know, that kind of image of this, this shameful place to be buried. Um, I'm not getting that when I'm doing the research on the potter's field. Um, Burial in a, in, a, in a, you know, state funded burial is a strategy for survival uh, for all kinds of people. Um, people had a funeral, the funeral in the church, they had the funeral at their graveside, the actual, the, 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 you know, that was the focus that the body wound up in the ancient plot, um, perhaps from their perspective, not the same as ours. Um, not shameful, just, just necessary. Um, so I found a number of, of connections. I found connections of like the, the um, a few of you know, the Cowsby family. The Cowsby family moved to Owen Sound in the 1850s, um, didn't stay long on the old Durham Road. Um, some of their family are buried in the indigent plot. Some, just because I had access to the entire um, everybody buried at Greenwood Cemetery, um, other many family members not, but, but in paid plots. Uh, a lot of the um, people in the indigent plot from the Durham Road, I think I mentioned, um, were elderly people who had, you know, had to leave their farms, come to Owen Sound, either living with family there, or as the century progressed, the jail became basically became a, 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 a refuge home 
for the elderly, the poor, the poor and the elderly. So some people uh, along the road, like Charlotte Diggs, who, you know, was widowed for 20 years, 10, 10, 15 years. And she was, she farmed as long as she could on her own. And, uh, but she eventually wound up in the jail uh, as a place of refuge. Uh, and when she died, she was buried in the plot. So there, there are connections like that. Um, uh, James Handy seniors buried at the, the cemetery on the old Durham road. Um, his son uh, moved when his wife died and we're assuming Charlotte's in the old Durham road cemetery, but we don't know because we don't have the stones. What can you do? Um, we assume she's there. He moved in with his son, uh, William, and he's in the indigent plot at Owen Sound. So that, that there's a kind of connection for people, for elderly people and certainly people like the Cowspies, um, like John Johnson's son, Christopher, like Edward Patterson, who saw the, the, the county town as a, as a better, more viable place to make a living. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned uh, squatters in your talk, and this is just kind of, a, uh, I guess, a comment to repeat what you said or um, clarify um, where are there government incentives to squat or? Well, um, to my knowledge, not in Gray County, but in the 1830s in what became the Queensbush settlement near Fergus, they had a treaty signed and they wanted people to get up there, but they hadn't surveyed. So in some, the, the government policies changed all the time, but at that time, um, people were encouraged to squat just so there'd be a British presence, right, in the newly acquired territory. I don't, I, the squatting happened everywhere. Actually, I, I, re, I remember now I was looking at a, a map of, and, and it's not just black settlers, all kinds of people um, squatted. Um, you know, went knowing the land was going to open up, you know, we're squatting so they could, you know, be the first ones there at the door, I guess. Um, so there, there were squatters everywhere. And over time, less and less uh, tolerance for it um, as land became, you know, harder to come by. Um, and as um, settlers, people who came, who had the location ticket, who had the right to be there, not, of course, not being tolerant of, of if they found people on their, on their lot. So I guess, I mean, I, I was hoping to find evidence in um, Gibson's field notes of squatters. I didn't. In the letters I've read that he wrote, so far, no. There may be more letters um, at the Gibson House in Toronto that should they ever open again. I could go and, uh, sorry, I didn't mean it like that. <laughs> Should they open? When they open, I, I, I'm going to go and have a look and see if there's somewhere else that he talks about squatters. Um, I have oral history from a descendant who's, who understands that um, this, the Sogging River itself was kind of a corridor um, and that, uh, and, and also uh, just that the, the people in the, settled in the, in the Guelph, Fergus, Wellington area that had lots of ways of coming up uh, into the Priceville area before any roads were surveyed. And, and there is oral history that suggests there was a very small black community there. So far, nothing in the, in the books. I think, I think the other comments are thank yous and uh, that they will enjoy the information. And definitely there's a lot to digest there. And uh, yeah, again, appreciate so much for putting this together and okay. your willingness to do it. Well, it was, it was fun and, you know, I was to be, I think I said earlier, Karen, I'm, I'm well, I guess it stopped snowing here where I am in Toronto, but I was kind of happy I wasn't, you know, driving up through a November snow event. Yeah, it's a great day for a ritual talk. <laughs>